Hey you doing everyone, greetings and welcome to today's episode of 8 Bits in the Basement. But the more observant of you will have noticed that we are actually in the garden. It's a strange day to be in the garden out here in France. Because today, being a day of August, is actually one of the warmest days we've ever had here. Right now at the moment, it's 37 degrees Celsius in the shade. But the reason I'm out here is to change scene a little bit. And also, I'm looking for hedgehogs that I can tank. But I haven't actually found any of them because I think they're nocturnal, so they only come out at night. But many of you may know that I finished my Bob the Betentacled Hedge Octopus game not too long ago. A little game I had been writing in Atari Basic for the Atari 2600. And what I'd like to do is celebrate that by putting that game onto a cartridge that will run on real hardware. So that's what we're going to do in today's episode. We're going to flash a ROM, we're going to put it onto a little PCB to make a cartridge and we're going to see does it run on the real hardware. But before we go any further I'd just like to thank PCBWay for their contribution to this episode because they're the ones who have made up the PCB for me. So what we'll also do is we'll have a look at what they've sent me and see what kind of quality their PCBs are and how easy they are to work out as well. So let's head into the basement out of this heat and we'll get to that. Okay so a couple of days have passed the warm, hot, scorching weather has been replaced by a thunderstorm. So if you hear any banging outside, that's pretty much what that is going on. But what I wanted to show you how to do today was to make the most simple form of Atari 2600 cartridge possible. 4 kilobyte cartridge. And on it we're going to put Bob and the Alien Fireflies so that I can show you this little game I wrote if you haven't seen it yet. Now I did kind of run into one little problem because I ordered all the parts I needed to make this cartridge but one of the vital necessary parts didn't show up and that was little 4 kilobyte 24 pin ROM chip that I ordered. So what I'm going to have to do instead because time is running out on this I'm back to work very soon I wanted to get this done during the summer holidays is I'm going to have to use 8 kilobyte ROM chips I have. Now the problem there is that they're, they have more pins. They're 28 pin chips. So we're going to be using these chips in place of other chips. But anyway, I've made up a little adapter. It should work. We're going to pretend that these are four kilobyte ROM chips for the purposes of this video. So with that being said, why don't you move in a little closer here and I'll show you the devices I have here to program and to erase my ROM chips. So basically what I thought I'd do is show you these little EEPROMs first. And we'll start with this guy here. This is a 24 pin 2K ROM chip from an original Atari cartridge. This here is the, the ROM that contains Space War by Atari which came out in 1978. But you'll notice it's just like a regular chip that, that you'd see in pretty much any computer with 24 pins on it. And the reason for that is this is what they call a mask ROM. Once it's been programmed it can't be erased. The code that's put on it is on it forevermore and that's the reason apparently why they buried so many copies of ET out in the desert that time because the ROMs once they had been programmed they couldn't be changed to anything else. So once you've programmed a ROM like this you're stuck with the contents on it. These here are the type of ROMs we're going to be using today. Now this guy here is a 28 pin 8k ROM. I had wanted to use a 4k that was exactly the same size as this but anyway the difference between this ROM and that ROM, apart from the size of it or the capacity of it, is this guy here has a little window on the front of it as well. And this window means that we can actually erase the contents of this ROM and use it again and again and again. And the way that we erase it is using this guy here, an EEPROM eraser. Now this is pretty much a sunbed, like you would use to suntan yourself more or less, only for these little guys here. And what you do is you open the drawer, you pop the chip in with the window facing up the way and you close the drawer. And when you turn it on, a little ultraviolet light bulb inside will pop on and shine UV light through the window of the chip. And the process takes anywhere from about two minutes to 10 minutes, but it will erase the chip for you. And you've got a chip that's all ready to be programmed with whatever code you want. And the way that they're programmed is using a device something like this. Now this here is a universal programmer. It's a, a mini pro or it's a clone of a mini pro. But uh, the model of it is the TL866CS and it's an old enough programmer but it connects to your computer by USB. You pop a chip in here and basically what you do is you select the chip type from thousands that are available in the software for this device and by clicking a button 
you can program your chip. It's as easy as that to do. So what we'll do is we will stop talking about it and we'll go erase a ROM chip and program it up with the CCAM version of Bob and the Alien Fireflies. If you want to program a ROM chip, the very first thing you're going to need is code to program onto it. So what I've done is I've headed on over to itch.io and I've done a search for Bob and the Alien Fireflies. And that's brought me here to my page where you'll find the game available for download. Now, I've put three different files at your disposition, depending, well, depending on where you are in the world. I've got an NTSC version for America. I've got a PAL-60 version for Atari 2600s that were meant to be used in the European regions. And I've also got the lesser known CCAM version, which was used in parts of Russia and also all over France. So the CCAM version is the one I'm going to be using today. And that's because I've got a real French CCAM Atari 2600 system. And I want to show how to make a cartridge that will run on real hardware, more or less. Now, the only difference between the versions is if you use the wrong version on the wrong console, you'll end up with the colors kind of mixed up. That's the only, the only real difference. But what we're going to do now that I've downloaded that to my desktop is we're going to open up my Mini Pro programmer here so that we can program the ROM chip. Now, I've set all this up to use that little 4K ROM chip that never arrived. So I've got it set up to use the NMC 27C32 chip, which is a four kilobyte chip. But because we're going to be using eight kilobyte chips today, what I'll need to do is change the chip type. So if I click here, I can actually do a search for different devices and it'll give me a list of all the manufacturers and it'll also give me a list of the different chip types that they make. And that way I can choose the very chip that I want to use. Now, I've already chosen before, so there's also a little arrow here that'll let me quickly select chips that I've used in the past. So the chip I'll be using is the STM27C64A. So we'll choose that one. And what I'm gonna do now that the chip has been chosen correctly is I'm going to open my file which I downloaded earlier, this one here, my Bob Ccam version 1.bin. And it'll give me a few options here so that I can change around the way it's loaded into the buffer. But we're just going to go with the default loading technique, more or less. So it's after loading this file into the buffer here. The next thing we want to do is we want to put our chip into our programmer. So inside, in this little EEPROM eraser, if I open it, you'll see there's a nice blue light there that's been erasing this chip, we'll just turn it off. I've got this chip here. So it's been baking away for about 10 minutes inside in here, so it should be fully erased. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to pop it into the programmer here. So what we do is we lift up this lever so that we open the ZIF or zero insertion force socket and we can put the chip in and then close it back down with the lever here again so it doesn't fall out. Now, the only thing to be careful of is that pin one of the chip is lined up with pin one of the socket. And usually a chip will have a little dot on it or a little groove cut out in the very top of it. And all you have to do is make sure it corresponds to the little image that they have here molded into the plastic of the programmer. But once you have that done, it's just a matter of clicking on the P here to program the chip. So if I click P, we'll get this window here where I can change a few bits and pieces if I want to, or just make sure that everything is set up right. And I click on program. Now you'll notice that this guy here is programming the code memory. And also this little run led has come on to show me that programming is taking place. Now, once this has been done, it'll be verified. And if it passes verification, it'll tell me that it's been programmed successfully. So there we go. Our programming has been successful. We should have a copy of Bob and the Alien Fireflies on this chip. So I think what we'll do next is we'll go have a look at the PCBs that PCBWay sent me, and we'll build the whole thing together now that we have all the parts. Okay, so if you want to make yourself a cartridge for the Atari 2600, one of the most important parts that you're going to need is the cartridge PCB. Now, I decided not to design my own because why reinvent the wheel? So I went to the Grand Ideas Studio website and I found the Gerber files for an Atari 2600 2 and 4K cartridge. I downloaded those Gerbers and I went to PCBWay's website and uploaded the Gerbers to them. And they took care of the manufacturing of my PCBs, which have been shipped to me in this box or this package right here. So we'll get to opening it 
and see what they've sent me. So while I'm trying to open this box with my semi-sharp scalpel, let me just tell you about PCB Ways world-class PCB manufacturing service. They can make 10 custom PCBs for you for just $5. And not only that, if it's your first time ordering from them, they'll give you a $5 coupon, which means that you'll get those 10 PCBs for the price of postage. That sounds like a pretty good deal to me. Anyway, let's get back to the video and see what I got sent to me inside in this box. Packed with lots of foam in there. And what I've got, oh look, a load of PCB Way goodies. Thanks very much for that, Zoe. Zoe is my contact with PCBWA, and she really, really is a great rep. She's a lovely person. And thanks very much for that, Zoe. So what I've got going here are the PCBs that I got made up. So we'll have a little look at them and see exactly what they look like. This stuff doesn't want to roll away on me. So I've went for a nice little blue PCB. And we'll just take a look at that. I'll see if I can focus it in. Okay, so finally we have focused on the board and here you'll see this is a high quality board. It's very rigid. You're not going to break it easy, I'll put it that way. And also you'll notice that all the holes here that where the pins of the chips go through are coated with metal. So they're very easy to actually solder to. And also the silk screen on the board is extremely legible. So it's a, it's a high quality board. And um, what you will notice maybe is that we've only been talk, talking about one chip, a ROM chip, and that's going to sit here. There'll be a little capacitor that goes here, but there's a second mystery chip that sits back here. I'll tell you all about that in a minute. But just allow me once more to thank PCB Way for manufacturing these boards for me. And what we'll do now is we'll put them into practice and see if we can solder it up and get it to work. Okay, so it's time to get soldering on this board and we'll see this, this little cartridge build actually work or not. But just before I start, you remember I told you there was a mystery chip we're going to put around the back here? Well, it's a logic chip we're going to put in here. It's a 7404 inverter chip, which looks just like this. And they weren't found in the original Atari cartridges. And the reason was that this here is our mask ROM from the Atari cart. And I said it doesn't have a window, so it can't be erased. But there was another difference with it as well. When the Atari wants to read data from this chip, it needs to turn it on. And what it does to turn it on is it sends a high signal to a pin on this. And the chip will turn on and talk to the Atari. These chips work differently. The signal that needs to be sent to it to turn it on is a low signal. So the problem that we have is when the Atari wants to talk to the chip, it'll send a high signal. If we're using one of these, it'll turn the chip off. So it's just not going to work for us. So the way we get around that is we put an inverter chip here and it will change the high signal that the Atari is sending to a low signal that will turn this chip on. So that is why we need to use a little inverter chip there. So um, yeah, what I'm going to do as well is I'm going to not solder chips directly to this particular PCB. I'm just going to solder sockets onto it for the moment. I'm going to solder this small one small socket here first because if not I won't be able to solder on the big one but um, the reason I'm going to do that is I'll be able to check and see that the logic or the inverter chip and also the ROM is programmed and they're all working properly before I solder them directly onto a fresh PCB and have a cartridge more or less like a cartridge Atari would have made back in the day so let's uh, solder that little thingy up and we'll see if it works or not. So what I'll do is I'll just place this little socket here where it goes, being careful that I'm after lining it up right. And I'm just going to hold it in place with a little bit of blue tech and we'll flip it over and we'll solder it. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to do is solder in this little capacitor. And finally, because I didn't have a 24 pin socket, I just cut a couple of pins off of a 28 pin socket. So we'll just insert it in again, making sure that little notch here on the silk screen corresponds to a little notch on this guy. Now, so that's our PCB soldered up. We've got our two sockets on it and our little capacitor here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the two chips into it, the inverter chip and also the ROM chip, and we'll see, does it work? So I've programmed my ROM chip, I've built up my PCB, and I've got my Atari 2600 set up. So we're all ready 
to try the whole lot out and see does it work together. But just before we do, let me say the only regret I have is those little 24 pin, four kilobyte ROM chips haven't arrived yet. So we're going to have to use this here. This is the 28 pin, eight kilobyte chip that we programmed up earlier on. But you see it's sitting in this Frankenstein sandwich of a kind of a pin converter device that I made up. So this guy is just three uh, chip sockets, one on top of the other so that I could wire up the pins so that a 28 pin chip would work in a 24 pin socket. But that's pretty much that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug it in to the cartridge PCB that we soldered up earlier. So that's that guy there plugged in. Now the general rule of thumb to remember, if you want to plug a cartridge into an Atari and you don't actually have a case on it to show you the orientation, is just make sure that the ROM chip is facing towards the TV. And that way everything should work out just fine, unless you're using one of these big Frankenstein sandwiches, which means that maybe it won't. But anyway, we'll try. So we power on. Yes, <laughs> so we've got Fireflies on screen, which means that this is programmed up and seems to be working at least, but we'll give it a good little test. And that way I'll be able to show you the Bob game as well. But the way I've programmed up this game, there are two modes. We've got a one player and a two player game. And they are selected using the game select switch. So we have one player and we have two player. And the way we start the game is with the game reset switch. So here we are, we've got Bob in the middle of the screen and we can move him around with the joystick. But the idea behind this game is that Bob has found a little blade in the forest filled with these fireflies. They start off green and then they turn yellow and then they turn red and if they go beyond red, well, they'll explode and that's game over. Now, the idea behind the game is to eat as many of these fireflies as you possibly can, just to rack up your points here at the bottom of the screen. But all the while that you're playing, you'll see that there are two beams going from left to right across the screen and they're teleportation beams from an alien vessel above and if you touch those well you get teleported away and that's pretty much game over for Bob as well. So that is our one player game with a little cyan colored Bob as you can see he's not brown like he is in the NTSC or in the uh, PAL versions because like I say the little CCAM Atari is kind of limited on colors so that that is why he doesn't really look hedgehoggy colors. But anyway, that's our one player game. The two player game is more or less the same but with some little variations. Straight away, Bob is playing against his buddy, Hog. And Hog is controlled by another guy plugged into the second joystick port. And what you're doing in this version of the game, the fireflies don't change colors so they won't ever explode. And as you saw there, Hog was hit by the teleportation beams, but he came back again. So again, there is no real game over in this version of the game. What you're doing is you're kind of combating against each other to try and be the first one to get 20 fireflies. So the only thing is, if you hit a teleportation beam, you're beamed away for five seconds. And when you come back, you're kind of immortal really for two seconds. You can't get beamed away again, but equally you can't eat fireflies. So it's like a se seven second penalty for touching teleportation beams more or less. But that is the two player game. First one to eat 20 fireflies, he's the one who wins. But there is a question that's been asked of me about this game. I've been talking from the very beginning about Bob the Betentacled Hedgehoctopus, and I've got a picture of Bob with tentacles there. And a young guy named Jordan, he even made this up for me, and delivered it to the house. He said, here, Pete, that's for you. It's kind of an effigy of Bob with his tentacles. And yet in the game, Bob doesn't appear to have tentacles at all, but what I'll say to you is this. If you want to see Bob with his tentacles, all you have to do is start a one player game, get more than 20 points and let a firefly explode. See what happens. But there you go. That's pretty much it for today's episode. I'd like to thank PCB Way for providing those PCs, PCBs so that I can, uh, I can make up more little cartridges. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. I hope you enjoyed it and we will talk to you all again very soon. So take very good care of yourselves. And until then, bye bye.